This is the day that has been given to us. Rather than creating it, rather than earning it, rather than deserving it, we receive this day as a gift. A gift from the universe, a gift from God, a gift from life itself. As we gather today online and in person, let us receive the gift of this day and make of it a time to recommit to our highest ideals and our deepest commitments. In our freely covenanted faith of Unitarian Universalism, we know that it is the shared commitments of our covenant, not any creed or belief, that bind us together in beloved community and that inspire us to faithful service. So as we enter our time of worship this day at the Birmingham Unitarian Church, let us join together in giving voice to the promise of this congregation's covenant. As part of this beloved BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all my interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, Pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning. All right. That's as it should be. It is good to be together again, whether you are joining us in the sanctuary or remotely via Zoom <clears throat> or watching this recording later. It is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection, greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of the folks who are currently on Zoom up on the screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. Now, it's our turn. We, are going, um, we who are gathered here will turn to face the black camera and do a great wave, a smile, and a welcome. 
If you are visiting us for the first time, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you are with us in the sanctuary, we invite you to join us after service for coffee and conversation in our social hall, which is located to the left as you exit the sanctuary. I should do my airline motion. If you are with us on Zoom, we invite you to stay on, call, on the call for a virtual coffee hour immediately after the service. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC at home, on campus, in the world. Every day we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building the beloved community. We join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. Around us, light is returning. It rekindles the spirit of life in the skeletons of trees. It brings forth new shoots from the soil. It wakes, from our, it wakes us from our winter slumber and invites us to see what is beyond. We light this chalice in the spirit of our Earth's awakening and to reaffirm our commitment to the value of our home. Please rise and body your spirit and join in singing our first hymn this morning, For the Earth Forever Turning. It's number 163 in Singing the Living Tradition. is a story about someone who loved the outdoors. His name was Henry David Thoreau. All his life, he loved nature. It was almost as if he had a small, still voice inside him that whispered, go outside, be amidst the trees and lakes and grass. This is your true home. Henry listened to that voice all of his life. Henry lived in Concord, Massachusetts more than a hundred years ago. The town had some buildings, but all around there were forests and ponds, rivers and fields. Henry loved being outdoors. He loved to explore. He liked the feeling of being close to the earth, of being surrounded by plants, bugs, birds, and wildlife. Outside, Henry was never bored. He was busy watching, 
finding and enjoying nature. Outside, Henry felt at home. Henry kept notes about nature and liked to share ideas about what he saw. Later, when he was grown up, he wrote that nature was like a nursery for him, a place where he can grow and thrive. Henry went to school and church, and he helped with the chores of his family, but most of all, he loved being outdoors. When he went to bed at night, he placed his bed so that he could look out at the stars. For Henry, seeing nature and knowing that he was a part of the world around him made him feel most comfortable. Henry grew up and went to school and later to college. He read a lot of books and he was especially interested in books written by transcendentalists who believed that appreciating the beauty of nature is a way of feeling close to the spirit of life or to God. Henry listened to that small voice inside him telling him to go spend time outside, exploring the icy snow or in the summer heat. He became friends with the transcendentalists who agreed that even grown-ups can learn a lot by spending time in nature. Henry hoped that one day he could live very simply in nature and he knew he would feel at home. One transcendentalist friend named Walt, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson told Henry, you should keep a journal about all the things you notice in nature. He also invited Henry to try out this idea of living close to nature. Henry called it his great experiment. He decided to make a very simple home on a large area of land that surrounded Walden Pond. The land was owned by his friend Emerson, who allowed him to live there in exchange for Henry's help doing some repairs around Emerson's house. Henry decided to build his home as small and simple and plain as it could be. He wanted to spend most of his time outside. He wanted to feel close to the land. Henry wanted to have time to notice and write about the changes that he saw, the birds, the plants, the leaves on the trees. Henry made a list of all the things that he would need to live on Walden Pond. He tried to include a few, as few things as possible. The list included some tools for farming, a bed, a writing desk, a table, and three chairs. With the help of his friends, Henry built a small cabin, just one room, 10 feet wide and 15 feet long. He used old wood, bricks from other houses, windows that nobody else needed to build his small cabin. When it was completed, Henry moved in. Although his friends and family understood what Henry was doing, townspeople found Henry's experiment in living in nature confusing. They wondered why he would want to live that way. But Henry listened to that still, small voice and he felt at home. He planted food for himself to eat using a small, the small amount of land. He took great care to notice all that was around him. He watched the changes in Walden Pond over the seasons. He found everything from grasshoppers to wildflowers to be beautiful and interesting. Henry wrote in his journal, I looked down into the quiet parlor of the fishes pervaded by a softened light. Ah, the pickerel of Walden. When I see them lying on the ice, I'm always surprised by their rare beauty. As if they were fabulous fishes, they possess a quite dazzling beauty. Henry lived on Walden Pond for more than two years. He came into town to see people, to work for Emerson, to get some supplies, but mostly, Henry remained at his home in the woods. Sometimes people would visit him there, and many children liked his small cabin, and they understood that feeling of being at home in nature. Then one day, Henry decided that he was finished. He had learned so much from living in nature that he felt ready to try something else. He felt ready to make his home with people again but he never forgot his time on Walden Pond. 
He wrote books about it, and he taught other people that caring about nature is important. Some people say that Henry David Thoreau was one of the most important naturalists that ever lived. Henry was able to listen to that voice inside him that told him that he was at home in nature. He was able to live his dream, and he felt at peace. As he finished his book about his time at Walden Pond, he wrote, I learned this, at least by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected. So today in RE, we're gonna do our own experiment and we're going to be celebrating Earth Day Sunday by making a special gift that will be shared with all of you next Sunday. At this time, our children and youth will join their adult facilitators at the back of the sanctuary to head off to class. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. So this month's plate collection recipient is Transportation Riders United, which was formed in 2001 to improve transportation access and mobility in Metro Detroit. They work with a diverse group of people, including minorities, the disabled, seniors, and business owners. Top priorities are given to supporting effective expansion of service throughout Oakland County, stopping the crisis of no-show buses by ensuring local bus agencies pay competitive wages, boost state investment in transit improvements, and ensure climate change is an important factor in transportation decision-making. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Our spiritual practices include opportunities to reflect individually and to share collectively. And sometimes that collective sharing of joys and sorrows takes a little different shape than other times. One was shared anonymously today, and it's a combined sorrow and joy. Please check the lost and found area by the pavilion courtyard window to claim your items which will revert to rummage sale if unreclaimed next Sunday. It would be a joy for people to find their long lost possession and I'm sure there was no subtle stealth announcement for the rummage sale coming up in that whatsoever. And for today only, I'm going to pause our practice of an embodied uh, spiritual practice and offer a little different kind of pastoral prayer. Uh, I do invite you into this time of deeper sharing, into uh, some prayerful words about our world as you begin to prepare, I invite you to find yourself reaching deep within, reaching far beyond yourself, and connecting with what you know as sacred. Spirit of life and of love, God known in so many ways and mystery beyond all knowing. We come together as always with hope, for a better world, yet knowing that in our world we have so far to go, and feeling the pain of strife, of violence that affects so many. In particular in this week, as many of us have for many weeks, reflecting on the conflict in the Middle East, praying as that conflict expands, including, yes, still Israel and Palestine and now also Iran, praying for an end to the violence and killing Praying that all who are harmed in the aftermath of war and violent attacks may find care and comfort. And that communities throughout the region and throughout the world may find a peace that is not currently known, not known in the Middle East for the violence and the attacks, not known too often here in this nation as increasing numbers of individuals face the mental, spiritual, and too often physical harm from Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. We, Unitarian Universalists, affirming a pluralistic faith and affirming 
freedom of religion. Let our hopes and our work continue to guide us towards a world in which not only acceptance, but affirmation of those of us with differences of creed, religion, race, and place of origin may find a greater understanding and an antidote to the violence that grows around them and around us. So may it be for us all. Amen. I invite you to join me now in a moment of silence. As we approach Earth Day, officially recognized tomorrow, two readings inspired by it to share from very different sources. The first reading comes from Jewish scripture, the book of Exodus, chapter 3, the first five verses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush has not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Our second reading is by the 20th century naturalist and ecologist, Aldo Leopold. It comes from his influential essay, The Land Ethic. All ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries 
of the community to include soils, waters, plants and animals, or collectively, the land. A land ethic, of course, cannot prevent the alteration, management, and use of these resources, but it does affirm their right to continued existence, and at least in spots, their continued ex existence in a natural state. In short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conquer of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for our fellow members and also respect for the community as such. Water rushed through the turbulent river at the foot of the cliff. At the top of the cliff, a few men were gathered around a campfire. Uh, they were uh, enjoying lunch while on a break from their work with the U.S. Forest Service. And looking down from the cliff at one point as they finished up their lunch, they saw an animal starting to climb out of the water. It, from a distance, and at first they thought it was a deer, but once it shook the water off of it fully, they realized that was no deer, it was a wolf. 
and quickly several other wolves, probably adult pups of the mama wolf that had just come out of the river, rushed up to join. One of the foresters wrote, in those days, this was the early 20th century, uh, in those days we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. So they quickly grabbed their rifles, they opened fire. Most of the pups scattered unharmed, but one pup limped away on a bad leg, and the mama wolf was down. The foresters scurried down the cliff as fast as they could, but there was none of the expected joy to be found in hitting their target. That one forester wrote, we reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. When I was young, I was full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, then no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But, he concluded, after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. The forester who wrote those words was Aldo Leopold. Now, Leopold later gained recognition as a nature writer and a naturalist, uh, one continuing in a uh, legacy of influential American nature writers that was started with Thoreau. And he wrote this description of the wolf and his fellow foresters in his celebrated essay, Thinking Like a Mountain. Later in his life, Leopold went on to become our nation's first professor of wildlife management at the University of Wisconsin and the founder of the Wilderness Society. He was one of the first leaders of the 20th century to call people to the cause of environmental justice. And now, well into the 21st century, we know how vital, we know how urgent this cause has become as we're growing in our awareness and knowledge about global climate change. It behooves us then, as people of faith, as spiritual people, to reflect on our spiritual connections to the earth, for these connections can and should undergird justice-making for the earth. And I find in Leopold's remarkable experience a striking example of how honoring our connections to the earth can impact our ethical perspectives and our commitments to justice as well as our spiritual lives. And I'll add that as it happens, today is the first of two Sundays here at VUC reflecting on these themes. Uh, we will have a lay-led service next Sunday organized by the Environmental Action Team. Uh, and I understand that there will be a a deeper reflection into some of the spiritual practices, I'll focus a bit more today on the ethical side of things. Because killing that wolf on the riverbank that day actually gave an example for, of a turning point. For Leopold, it was a turning point that helped him expand his own ethical parameters. It was the moment he began to reject his selfish, but all too common, view of nature as a collection of resources ripe for human taking. Encountering that fierce green fire in the eyes of that dying wolf helped Leopold to see that there was a larger view to take. When he began to think about wolves the way that a mountain might, he saw new reason to care for the lives of creatures he had once considered obstacles. Aldo Leopold's transformative encounter at the bottom of that cliff led him to devote his life to expanding the circle of care, expanding the circle of justice to wildlife and to the land. That's why he's widely regarded today as the father of modern environmental ethics, and his essay, The Land Ethic, is the seminal text in it. 
And I should add that that's something relevant in my life in a particular way. A few of you know that uh, before beginning my studies for the ministry, my academic field was philosophy. Side note, you know how you get a philosophy major off of your lawn? <laughs> you pay him for the pizza, because it's the only job they can get. <laughs> but more sincerely, the master's degree in philosophy that I studied uh, focused in environmental ethics. Leopold was seminal in our work and our studies in that program. And one of the things that I think about when I reflect on Leopold's writing is that the moment of watching the green fire die in the wolf's eyes was, in fact, a spiritual experience for Leopold. Now, I define spirituality in a very specific way. And I want to stress, this may not be the most poetic of definitions, but it's one which I've found functionally relevant in my life. Spirituality is our response to our experience of what is ultimate. Let me repeat that. Our response to our experience of the ultimate. We as Unitarian Universalists know that that we can identify in many different ways that which is ultimate in our lives. But when we have experiences related and relevant to that, how we respond is how we live out our spiritual lives. So when Aldo Leopold looked into the wolf's eyes, he was thrown into an encounter with something that was far greater than himself, with something that was sacred. It was as sacred to him as the burning bush that Moses encountered. And as with Moses, the experience led him to respond, to do something about it, something that added meaning and connection to his experience of the ultimate. Now, it's too common in our society to think of spirituality and justice as being disconnected or even opposed. Many people think spirituality is some inward experience locked tight within one's own soul and mind, while justice work seems outward-focused, never about oneself. But both Moses and Leopold each proved in their own ways that spirituality and justice can be related because our spiritual lives can nurture and revitalize our justice-making efforts, and justice work can be engaged as a spiritual practice. It can be draining if it's our only spiritual practice, and there is a danger of burnout. But when it is an important part of our spiritual practices, it can be so vitalizing. Leopold's work to protect wildlife, to extend justice to natural lands, came in response to that profound experience with the wolf, that spiritual experience. And so many people engaged their struggles for justice from the deep wells of encounter with that which they know to be ultimate, to what 12-step communities call the God of their understandings. However, similar or different that might be to more traditional views of God. Their justice works were spiritual responses to encounters with the holy in their lives. And for us people of liberal faith, it's natural to think of justice in terms of social justice. But our work for ecological justice is also important. And its work has grown so much more complex. And yes, it has grown far too urgent now in the 21st century. Here in this large and complex metropolitan area with its own unique relationship to fossil fuels, I say as a native Texan, Even with all the surrounding natural beauty of this state, there are other justice concerns that might seem more relevant, more immediate uh, than fighting for environmental causes. And that's understandable if one takes a simplistic and isolated view 
of various injustices. At the same time, our growing knowledge of global climate change, paired with the growing obviousness of large-scale inaction to slow its pace, present us with profound questions of justice and ethics for every city and region. Now, while I freely admit that I am no scientist, the evidence that I have seen convinces me that our planet has passed many, if not most, of the tipping points on global warming. And my point being, I don't believe it fits our current day reality the way it once did to speak of reversing climate change. Regrettably, I believe that what we can achieve now, that frankly the best we can hope for, is slowing its now inevitable progress. And that is a hard feeling to live with. It's a diminishment of hope, which I've struggled with over the last few years. I know the temptation to convince myself, falsely convince myself, that any action towards ecological health or justice is futile, irrelevant. There are moments when I sometimes think it's just too late. Now, you might be wondering why I'm sharing these moments of hopelessness with you. I mean, after all, I'm a clergy person. I'm supposed to be a professional hope monger, right? <laughs> but what we have to remember is that diminished hope, however bad it may feel in the short term, is never the same as loss of hope there is still much good that can be achieved, even if it might be less than we could have achieved had this work begun in, against climate change begun in earnest globally 50 years ago. But also, I'm sharing this with you because I suspect I'm not alone in those moments of despair. For those who might be prone to similar moments, I invite you to consider Another dimension of these ecological issues, a dimension that connects to justice work and so many of its manifestations. Now, as I alluded to earlier, throwing oneself into justice work, be it social, economic, legal, or environmental justice, can become overwhelming. And yes, it can deeply drain people. I have seen that happen to activists I've worked alongside. But Theodore Parker, the great 19th century Unitarian minister, a, a contemporary of Thoreau's, and also an ardent abolitionist, first offered an insight that Martin Luther King Jr. famously reiterated. It's the insight that the universe has a moral arc. It is a long arc, but it bends towards justice. And the thing is, Bending that arc, that long arc, even a little bit further in justice's direction, well, it takes sustained, concerted effort. At times, it can expend huge stores of mental and emotional energy. But that was true for the civil rights struggles of the 50s and 60s, for the anti-war movements during Vietnam and the Iraq wars. It's true for environmentalists today. When we let ourselves get caught up in the anxiety, get caught up in the urgency of the many causes that deserve our attention and our activism, it's true that we can hollow ourselves out mentally and emotionally. But while this draining experience is a loss of mental and emotional energy, it's also spiritual. Because when we reflect on the dimensions of what we know to be ultimate, we see a way to ground our work for justice, including environmental justice, in our spirituality. And this, I'd argue, is the hopeful side of this work. Even, we can even develop and nurture our spirituality through our justice work in ways that are not draining to us but that are fulfilling, that are energizing. I uh, 
remember the words of Felix Adler of the ethical culture movement, uh, one of the uh, influential humanist religious movements in America, who explained that spirituality is consciousness of infinite interrelatedness. Spirituality is consciousness of infinite interrelatedness. And I like even better how a similar sentiment was put by the Unitarian Universalist minister and historian Mark Morrison Reed. He makes the connection between a relational spirituality and justice even clearer in words that will be familiar to a few of, the, of you. They are in the back of our gray hymnal. He wrote, there is a connectedness, a relationship discovered amid the particulars of our own lives and the lives of others. Once felt, it inspires us to act for justice. In an ecological context, the wilderness that Leopold saw in the dying wolf led him to recognize the wolf's interrelatedness with deer and scrub brush and the entire ecosystem of the mountain. Leopold explained it this way in his essay. Since then, I have lived to see state after state extirpate its wolves. In other words, completely wipe them out. I have watched the face of many a newly wolfless mountain and seen the south-facing slopes wrinkle with a maze of new deer trails. I have seen every edible bush and seedling browsed first to anemic destitude and then to death. I have seen every edible tree defoliated to the height of a saddle horn. Such a mountain looks as if someone had given God a new pruning shears and forbidden him all other exercise. And, Leopold, and Leopold concludes, excuse me, in the end, the starved bones of the hoped-for deer herd, dead of its own too much, bleach with the bones of the dead sage or molder under the high-lined junipers. Leopold came to see that the mountain also deserved justice for its ecological well-being and that this justice must include support for the balance of species that compose the mountain's ecosystem. This larger justice denies the supposed benefits of killing off predator species like wolves. More generally, it shows how becoming conscious of wider circles of interrelatedness between human, wolf, deer, and brush inspired Leopold to act for justice, for the wolves and for the mountain. An ecological ethic is inherently relational. And while it's not inherently spiritual, an ecological consciousness does leave us more open to the awareness of that infinite interrelatedness that Felix Adler described, defined as spiritual. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, BUC is in covenant with other UU churches, fellowships, and parishes. As it stands now, that covenant includes uh, the promise to affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And after this summer and the final vote on the proposed Article II revisions, either that language will remain or it will be replaced with other language that lifts up the value of interdependence. So it's still going to be key for us whichever way it's articulated. We commit as a community of progressive faith to engage our world in all of its interconnectedness, respecting the deep relationality that is present in all. And by responding to our experiences of these sacred interrelations, we live out the kind of relational spirituality that can feed our justice work and expand it to all the created world. May we all come close 
come closer to building that beloved community towards which Martin Luther King Jr. called us of more fully achieving what our Jewish friends and neighbors know as tikkun olam, the repair of the world. So may it be for us all. For our closing hymn this morning, I'm inviting the choir to come amongst you in the congregation. And if you would please rise and body your spirit and join in our beloved Blue Boat Home, number 1064. And so as we leave this sacred time, as we leave the many sacred places where we have gathered, may we carry with us the gifts of gratitude for the nurturing of our spirits and community, of humility when we fall short of our highest aspirations, and of resilience to strengthen our resolve. With these, may we go forth to serve this hurting world in the spirit of love. Go in peace.